I know it's been a while. I, I've been teasing this series for what seems like years. It, it has to be at least a year. I am finally ready to do the introduction video for the EMC for Everyone series. This first video is just gonna be kind of a general introduction and I'm gonna go over what tests we'll be doing and even going and doing some of those tests on a board that I have. So without any more delays, let's jump right into it. So for this video and actually for the next few, I'm going to be focusing on the evaluation board, that buck converter board from the first evaluation board series. If you haven't checked that out, I'll have a uh, link up above and in the description. Make sure you check that out. And the goal for this series is I'm going to try to do my best to not say it depends. Something, and that's, that's really why I decided to do this series, so much in EMC gets broken down into individual parts that really are outlined as really dependent on what you're doing. So sometimes you should ground this to the chassis, sometimes you should do this to the other ground, and you really can't get any like cut and dry like you should usually do this, or most of the time this works. And of course, I'm not saying there's ever a one size fits all solution, but there are some really good guidelines that you can come up with that do work most of the time. So my goal with this series is to figure out what those are, show them in a way that makes sense, and present it to where if you're working on a buck converter, you should do this and this, and probably try to avoid doing this. And then you can take those general guidelines and utilize them in whatever design you're working on. And the focus is mostly going to be on myth busting. So the video will be does changing from a two layer board or the myth will be two layer boards are always worse than a four layer board when it comes to EMC. So then we'll have two boards compare and contrast and see what works but not all videos are going to be focused on myth busting. And that was the original reason for the series it was going to be called EMC Myth Busting, but I didn't wanna get stuck into just doing videos on that topic. So that's why the name EMC for Everyone I think fits a little bit better. And by their very nature, these EMC videos are always going to be really nitty gritty and intricate. And I wanna make sure that the videos are going to be in a short, compact form, which is easy to digest. So my plan going forward is going to be the videos that go on YouTube are going to be 10 to 15 minutes at tops. And if it's, say, a myth-busting topic, the focus will be on back to the two-layer versus four-layer. It'll simply be going into what the design is, what the changes are from the two to a four layer and then focusing on what the results are. So by doing this, you were able to see this got better. And I'm going to focus on the results and showing off what changed. So those, like I said, are 10 to 15 minutes. And then I'm going to have a supplemental video that is going to go up on Patreon. Those are going to be way more in depth, probably, depending on the video, probably 20 to 30 minutes and that's going to go into more of why it changed. So by changing to a four layer, you were able to affect the return paths, you were able to affect a closer dielectric, all those other factors that then caused the result to be what it is. It's still going to also cover in more depth what the results were, what are the more detailed plots and whatnot, but the core focus of the supplemental video is going to be in why it caused the results. One final thing I wanna to touch on before we go into the actual test is something you're going to hear me talk about all the time in this series, and that's quantitative versus qualitative. And something that is really big with compliance testing, but especially pre-compliance testing, is a lot of the tests you do, you can only do so much to relate it back to an official standard without a full anechoic chamber, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment, there's only so much you can do. So when I refer to these terms, this is what I mean. 
If I say quantitative, that means I can have a board, I can do a specific test to it, and I can say, hey, based on the results of that test, it looks like it would pass or it looks like it would fail. I can directly relate that back to an official standard. On the other hand, if I have, say, two boards and I change the filter element of one board, I then do a test to both boards, the one with the filter element, presumably, gets a little bit better. I'm just able to qualitatively say that, I'm able to qualitatively say that, hey, that filter made this board better. I can't say by how much, I can't say if that now makes it pass or it still is going to fail, but a lot of times you don't really need to. The whole goal is to do things to make your board better. And a lot of times you can combine that with quantitative testing to get a pretty good idea of if your changes will make it work. So with this buck converter and switching regulators in general, like I said, they're really prone to conducted emissions. Conducted emissions are emissions that travel on the actual input wire, whether it's AC or DC, but in the case of a DC switching regulator and in this board, it's of course DC. And those conducted emissions, the normal test standards only go up to around 30 megahertz and switching regulators are obviously much lower than that. So in the one megahertz or lower range. So conducted emissions are really prone to happen with switching regulators. And something, something in general that's, that's a pet peeve of mine, and I've been seeing it more and more even on pretty big YouTubers, is just because a design works doesn't mean it's a good design. And you see that a lot with switching regulators. And the data sheets of manufacturers aren't, aren't doing any good with this because a lot of them will show what your input capacitance needs to be for it to operate. And a lot of times, especially in lower frequency regulators, they will recommend and show a single big electrolytic capacitor. That is not ever going to allow it to pass any sort of EMC testing. The rule of thumb that I've always used is if you have a switching regulator with a connection directly to the outside world, if you don't have some sort of filtering, it will not pass. End of story, it's going to radiate and or conduct to the point to where it won't pass any standards. So I figured a really good first comparison to do is let's show how important filtering of any type is. So what I did is I removed all of the filtering on this board. I have two boards built. One is exactly like designed. The other, I removed all ceramic input caps. There was a total of seven 22 microfarad ceramics on the output side of the ferrite bead. Those were removed. The ferrite bead was removed and also the input ceramic on the input side of the ferrite, that was also removed. The ferrite bead was then just replaced with a piece of wire. So one board has absolutely no filtering, just the electrolytic capacitors. Then the other board has the full array of ceramics and ferrite just as designed. The test setup that I'm using for conducted emissions is pretty basic. It has a five microhenry listen to help provide a reproducible source for our load. The input side, the ground, is tied to this ground plane. The output goes to our device under test, and then the output of the buck converter goes over to our DC load, which we can adjust. And then the output of the listen goes up to our spectrum analyzer. I'm going to start with the board that doesn't have any filtering simply because it's going to be a lot easier to see what's going on with it. The setup for the spectrum analyzer is pretty common among most conducted emission standards. The start frequency is 150 kilohertz. The stop frequency is 30 megahertz. The amplitude is set in dB microvolts. I have a limit line at 60 dB microvolts. I'm going to have a full test suite that has the full standards at each frequency, but for now, you're wanting to stay under 60 definitely. 
And then I also have a peak table, which will show any peaks that are above 55 dB microvolts. When we turn on the power supply, it's pretty obvious that we have some serious issues going on. The first, what looks like five harmonics are all at the line or above. And this is with the DC load turned off. So if I turn the DC load on at one amp, you can see it gets even worse. And if we go all the way up to eight amps, which is about the maximum that this listen can handle, we can see all the way out to really the 18, 20th harmonics. All of them are showing what probably would fail. So no surprise to anybody that you actually have to have some sort of filtering on a buck converter. So I've now swapped out the board for the one that is as designed with the filter elements. So this should make a pretty big difference compared to the first. And with the power supply turned on, again, no surprise, it is a massive improvement. This is with the DC load off. And really the only peak that we can see whatsoever looks to be the fundamental frequency at one megahertz. But even that is below the 55 limit peak. So it's not even showing up on our peak table. So now I'll start to bump up the current and see how high I have to do the current before it starts to show any sort of peak on the table. So at around two amps, we're getting a peak right at 55. And if I go up to five, now we're crossing the limit line. And now I'll sit it right at eight amps. So at eight amps, again, the maximum for the listen we're getting a peak just on that fundamental frequency of around just under 70 dB microvolts. So with this being pre-compliance testing, I would absolutely not feel confident running this board at its max current or anywhere above five amps because this just does not give us enough headroom. And what I can also do is bump the stop frequency down to 10, mega, 10 megahertz and we can see that single peak even more. And this makes sense. This is something I'm gonna to touch on in the extended version, but I'm also going to do a separate EMC video on it as one of the myths, is ferrite beads, they really are, they're really only good for higher frequency filtering. And that's why you look at some of the higher order harmonics, even what would be way above this, that's when they really come into form. So I was planning on doing a few more tests with these, but honestly, with how big of a difference there was with the conducted emissions between the two boards and the fact that conducted emissions is always going to be the biggest issue with a switching regulator like this, I really don't think it's necessary. So I'll save those tests for the future videos. And if you're interested in learning more about why the ferrite and the ceramic capacitors weren't quite enough to filter that fundamental switching frequency at one megahertz. I'll definitely be talking about that in the extended version. So if you're interested in that, make sure you check out my Patreon and also don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of the future videos in this series. And I really hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope to see you guys back in the next one soon.